Well, amen, it's already getting good. <laughs> well, this time I want to introduce uh, Pastor Tim Burton, who's, been, who's the pastor of Flippin' Memorial Baptist Church. How many years have you said you've been there, brother? 24 years. You don't hear that very often anymore. Uh, so 24 years. Well, Brother Tim, we want to invite you to come up and break the bread of life for us this afternoon. Well, good evening. You can tell I've got a good strong voice, so you'll be able to hear me well tonight. I can tell you and promise you that. But it is good to be in God's house. Always a joy and a privilege and an honor to be able to stand behind a sacred desk and break the bread of life. And uh, it's just been a wonderful opportunity that uh, Brother Brian has given us to, to be here with you folks this week. I always look forward to uh, just being able to come to one of our Surrey Baptist churches and being able to share God's wonderful message of hope, a message of love, but also a message of conviction. Because uh, as I look around and I see our churches today, I'm afraid that we're in a situation of uh, needing revival. You know, uh, if you ask yourself the question, what is revival? Well, when I think of revival, I gave it a definition not too long ago, and it's a simple definition. And I know we could actually go into a long litany of what a revival is, but here's what I believe a revival is. It's when one experiences an improvement in their relationship and devotion to the Lord. It's just kind of simple. We want to improve our relationship with God. You see, revivals today can affect a, a lot of people. They can affect us personally. They can affect our families. They can affect our churches. They can affect our nation. They can affect our denomination. And we need revival today. When I look around... Uh, a few people are really living a godly lifestyle today. When I think about it, very few people seem to be really living for the Lord today. And we need, and, and I'm talking about church folks. I'm not talking about lost people. I've, I'm a firm believer of what the Scripture tells us, that when God's people, when the church gets right, then everything else will follow. When the church gets on fire for God, we'll see lost people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You see, the world looks at us today, they don't see much difference. When they look at, when the world looks at church folks, you know what they see? They see believers who go to the same place as unbelievers, whether it's bad, whether it's uh, immoral, or whether it's moral or, or good. They see believers using the same kind of language, tell the same off-color stories as they do those who are out in the world. They see believers talk about the same things as unbelievers never about the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, when I think about that, no wonder the, the unbelievers don't want what we've got. No wonder they don't want to come into our church house. So I believe we're in desperate need of revival. And folks, we need our lives as church folks, as believers. We need it cleaned up, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, repent of our sin so God can use us in a mighty way. We need a revival. I want to start with tonight do you feel that you need a revival because I want you to understand something if the church is going to have a revival it's going to have to start with me and it's going to have to start with you we've got to get revived because we are what makes up the church the church is not the building the church is not the pews the church is not the, 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 the carpet the church is you and me and if we want to see God move in a special way I believe it's time for revival. That's kind of pre-sermon number one. I want to move into our text tonight. If you have your Bibles, if you will, turn to Psalm 137. Psalm 137. I'm going to look at a message uh, as Brother Brian and I do again. I want to say thank him for asking me to come this way this week. And uh, I do have a couple of folks from our church, Benny and Sandy Bowman. Y'all might re recognize them as the... Uh, uh, the parents of uh, uh, Misty Questenberry, and I know you'll know that name by regularly, but they, they're their, their parent, her parents, and they're always here to support us, and we're certainly thankful for them being here tonight. But if you have your Bibles and turn to one, Psalm 137, I'm going to ask you once you're turned there, if you're able to, if you will stand in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, precious, infallible, inerrant word. 
Psalm 137, beginning in verse number 1, said, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harp upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they wasted us, required us of myrrh, singing, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for this opportunity to share with these wonderful folks here this week. God, right now as we go look into your word for just a little while, I pray that you hide us behind the cross. Lord, that you send down an unction from above, that you give us what no man can earn, no man deserves, and that's the, uh, the power and the spirit of the Holy Spirit to, to just take over our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and our words and then penetrate the hearts of each one of us to truly hear the message you have for us here tonight. I pray you move in a great way. God, not just tonight, but in, in this week, that when we get finished up on Wednesday night, maybe the series of services, that revival will just have begun here in the Westfield community, and it would, it would move and spread throughout all of Surrey and Stokes County and, and all over North Carolina and even, yes, the, the nation and the world. God, again, we thank you and we love you for your many, many blessings, God. And all that's accomplished will not fail to give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a member of the United States Supreme Court back in 2000, I mean, excuse me, in 1902 to 1932, and his name was Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. They asked uh, 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 Justice Holmes one day, he said, uh, why did you make the career choice that you made to go into law? Justice Holmes said this, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. <laughs> you know, I, I thought about what his statement was, and I know he attributed it to the clergy or he attributed it to preachers, but I'm going to be honest with you folks. I believe tonight that one of the problems in the church is that we act too much like undertakers. We're not joyful and happy about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in our hearts and in our lives. You know, there was a character in the Winnie the Pooh series. His name was Eeyore. Do you remember Eeyore? Eeyore was uh, always that discouraged, pessimistic, gloomy, negative, per, uh, negative animal. You know, he'd always say, it's a pretty day if it don't rain. He was always that way. Folks, I'm afraid that we're living in a day and age that too many of us that are Christians, or we claim to be Christians, we come into the church house and, and we, we come in and, and we worship through the motions of worship we, we go through our rituals of worship and yet when if the world comes in or even amongst ourselves we look around and we don't see anything but discouragement we don't see anything but gloominess we don't see anything but negativity you see in this Psalms I want you to realize we find the children of Israel with that same discouragement they're, they're gloomy they're negative they're pessimistic why? Because notice there in verse number 1, they've been carried off into to Babylon. And folks, this was a judgment that God had come to Israel because over a period of time, the nation Israel had gotten to... Uh, they were serving God, but then they began to drift away from God. They began to go into their own direction and, and follow the ways of the world, if you will. They, got, they stopped following God. And what happened? God had to, to, had to, to discipline them. And so what did he do? He, he allowed Babylon to come in and take over this group of people and carry them back to their country. Folks, every time that they were out of the will of God, God's judgment would come upon the nation Israel. And then, and then they would become sorrowful. They'd become discouraged. They would become gloomy. And you note there in verse number 1, it said that they remembered Zion. That meant they remembered the days when they were faithful. When the days that God's blessings were being poured out on the nation and they were joy filled and they were excited about being a servants of God. Where, where are we at in the church tonight? Do we remember those days? Y'all celebrate homecoming today? We did too. 
And I, I talked to our folks about how that we think, like, think back to, uh, and I had some people even to mention days back in the day when they had services and people would come in. They would stand, uh, and, and many times it was standing room only or they have to open the window so people could hear. Why? Because people were excited about what Jesus was doing in their lives and in their families and in their churches. <coughs> but yet, where are we at tonight? We've gotten to a point that we're gloomy. We're, we, we don't remember those days or we've forgotten those days. Why? Because we're, we're used to just being sitting around with a gloom-filled face and everybody wondering, why don't people want what we got? <laughs> be honest with you, in many cases, I don't want what church people's got because we show it. But then notice what happened here in verse number 2. They, they took, and the Bible said that they hung their harps in the willow trees. Now, I want you to understand the harps in this particular verse gives me an impression. Uh, they, they were symbols. They were symbols of a time of worship. They were symbols of a time of joy. They were symbols of a time of service. They were symbols of a time of victory. But now they were in the heathen land. They were far away from the right fellowship and relationship with God. So what had they done? They had lost their song. Their worship was over. Their service was forgotten. Their victories were a memory. And their joy had been lost. They were negative. You see, we see Israel in this condition. I'm afraid tonight we get a picture, as I've already said, of many Christians in churches. We've gotten out of the will of God. We're not where we're supposed to be. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. We're out of the will of God for our lives. And when we do, what happens? We find that we have no song. We find that, that our worship is not meaningful. And I'm not talking about just worship service that happens right here in, in these walls of this church. How's your private worship time? Is it a burden to spend time with God? Is it a burden to read the Bible? Is it a burden to pray? When was the last time you was just reading your Bible and all of a sudden you, you run across a verse of Scripture? And we were kind of picking about this. We, uh, Brother Brian uh, is, uh, is leading the class, one of the classes that I'm taking there at, at the Surrey Baptist. So have you read that verse of Scripture and you want to give out a good old Rick Flair? Woo! <laughs> Be about it. I can tell you, Cynthia and I, we, we do our quiet time. She's usually in, in, in a, a, the little bedroom where she's got a desk. I'm usually at the bar every morning when we get up. And, and a lot of times I can hear her in there, and I can tell she's got something that's excited. Because I hear her jump up, and I hear them feet coming through the house. And she'll say, look here what I found. Look, look, what, look what this Bible said. Look what this verse Scripture said. Ain't it amazing? And I don't believe in coincidence, folks. I believe it's God incidents. And that's the reason over there. We need to be excited about serving God. We need to be excited about following God. Is our worship not only in the building here meaningful, but is it at home? How about our service? Are we doing what God wants us to do? Are we being faithful to follow Him? You see, we get to a point we don't even know victory. There's no real joy in our lives. Maybe we remember the days we were filled with joy. But right now, we've... We're missing them because some things are wrong in our lives. You see, that's when we become like a group of Eeyores. We're discouraged. We're sorrowful. We're gloomy. We're negative. Tonight, I, I want to ask this question. Where are our harps? And are our harps silent? Where's your harp? Is it in the tree? Or is it silent? Or is it sounding out so the world could hear what Jesus has done in your lives? Have we gotten away from God? Have we just hung our harps in the willow trees and said, I'm stopping. I'm not playing anymore. Where's our harps at? Tonight I want to see a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to look at two truths. Truth number one, I want to look at the reasons for silent harps. And we see that in this text here. 
I believe there's three reasons we can see in this text. Reason number one was that Israel was out of their rightful place. Notice in verse 1 it said they were. They were in Babylon. Israel wasn't where they were supposed to be. If they were where they were supposed to be, they would have been in Jerusalem. They would have been in their home country. They would have been serving God there and doing what God wanted to do. Now, we know that God took them down there because they had been disobedient. But now here they were in that place. Babylon, of course, in the Scripture represents a wicked place or a type of world. You see, when a child of God, when we get away from God, we get out into the world. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. When we get away from God, we get away from being where God wants us to be in the right place, then we begin to take on the things of the world and we begin to lose our joy. We begin to lose our joy. There's some examples in Scripture. There was a man by the name of Lot. Remember Lot? He was a just man according to the Scripture. But what did he do? He, he drifted away from God. He got to a point there as they, they were sitting in the mountain and they were looking one day and, 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 and Abraham said, uh, hey, where do you want to go? And the Bible tells us, what did he do? He looked towards Sodom. And then he moved towards Sodom. And eventually, what did he do? He pitched his tent. He went right into Sodom. He went right into the town. And folks, when you read the story of Lot, you find that he allowed, he allowed the things of the world uh, to become his God. He, he led his family down to that awful place called Sodom. Folks, his heart was silent. And when he finally tried to warn his family, after the angel came and said, Look, it's going to be destroyed. Read the story. His sons-in-laws laughed at him. Why are you all of a sudden religious? Why is it all of a sudden we can get religious when the doctor says cancer? Why is it we can all of a sudden get religious when there's an accident and the patrolman shows up and says a family member's been hurt? How can we all of a sudden get religious when we go to work and they say your services are no longer needed? You see, folks, we use God too many times as a spare tire if we're going to have joy and peace and, and harmony and love in our hearts folks I'm going to tell you something we've got to get in the right place and we've got to say God I want you in control of my life every step that I take and I want to be joyful I want to be joy filled I want my heart to be sounding for you just quickly a couple others how about Samson <laughs> He lost his power sleeping in the lap of the world, trusting the world. Trusting the world would... Folks, I want you to understand, trusting the world will render us useless in the service of God. That's what happened to Samson. How about the prodigal son? He ended up the pig pen. Why? Because of the riotous living, following the world and not God, living life his way, seeking the money, the pleasures, the fame, the fortune of the, of the world. Folks, let me tell you something. That'll just lead us down a, a path of destruction and it'll lead us down a path of sorrow. How about Peter as Jesus was at trial? He was there warming by the fires of the world. Sat down among the world, didn't he? And it caused him to deny even knowing Jesus Christ. Folks, these are examples in Scriptures that people who had silent harps, these were men of God. But in their condition, they were out of place. But because they were out of place, they could not worship. They could not serve. They could not witness for the Lord. You may be here tonight, and you're not in the right place with God. You've gotten out of His will. You've gotten into the ways of the world. You've been taken in by the deceptions of the devil. And folks, let me tell you something. Satan will make it seem easy. He'll make, he'll make it seem so right. And usually, gradually, you begin to move from the right place. And when I'm talking about the right place, I'm talking about in the center of God's will. You begin to move toward the world. And folks, it's a gradual thing. There's not one of us in here who will wake up in the morning and say, you know, I believe I'm going to get out of God's will today. It's something that happens slowly. It's the reason we've got to look at ourselves. And then we get to that point, we're not able to serve God. We lose our joy. We lose our song. We lose our victory. We lose our worship. Therefore, our, our hearts are silent. Oh, folks, 
Israel's hearts were silent because they were not in the right place. But a second reason we see that Israel's hearts were silent, and you see that in verse number 2, is that they were out of practice. Not only were they out of place, they were out of practice. Notice it says, We hanged our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. You see, they'd gotten out of the will of God, and then they were taken to Babylon, and it wasn't long because they'd gotten out of the will of God. What did they do? They just hung their harps up in the trees. Basically said, we're not, going to, we're not going to play anymore. Have you ever been able to do something really well and then quit for a while? And then tried to go back and do it again? I had a family member. Used to play the piano. Was just a tremendous piano player. When I, I mean, I'm talking about when I was a little bitty feller. Actually played for the church. But for whatever reason, she, she stopped playing. She didn't play and went several years. And I'll never forget one, one, one get-together, one family get-together. We was there at Grandma's and Grandpa's, and somebody said to her, said, how about playing the piano? We'll all sing. And she went over and she sat down and she hit a couple of keys. Hmm. She tried a little bit more. And she tried a little bit more. Finally, she got up and she said, I've just lost it. You see, folks, when we get out of practice of serving God, when we get away from serving God, then we're not able to do what we are supposed to do. There's so many backsliding Christians today that are not serving God because we've hanged our harps in the willow trees and we've gotten out of practice. You may say, well, what do you mean by getting out of practice? Folks, what I mean by doing the things that God wants us to do regularly to maintain that close relationship with Him, that, that walk of fellowship with Him. Folks, we can't know the will of God unless we maintain our relationship with God. So what am I talking about? You've gotten out of practice of reading the Bible. And not only reading the Bible, but speaking on it. You know, it's okay to sit here and call the words, but how about stopping after you've called a few words and say, God, what do you want this to say to me? What's it say to me for today? How can I serve you better today? We get out of practice of obeying the word. <laughs> oh, me. Well, that, that, we could stop right there and go for a while, but we won't because you'll understand. You know what I'm talking about. How many of us always obeyed our parents? Everything they told us to do. I, I'll have to admit I didn't. I was a kind of a rambunctious little kid. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I was so rambunctious. My grandpa Burton told my daddy and mama, said that boy will be in prison before he's 16 years old when I was about seven or eight. Thankfully, he missed that prediction anyway. Because why? We got to obey the word. We got to witness. Folks, there's a real need. But when was the last time you just told somebody Jesus loved them? When was the last time? How about singing? You may say, well, preacher, I can't sing. I can't carry a tune. What does it say? We can't carry a tune in a bucket. Well, you know what? I never saw in the Bible where it said that God expected us to sing perfectly. But I did hear it, see in the Scripture where it says, make a joyful noise. And let me just tell you something. If you don't sing anywhere else but in the car, when you're going down the road and they can't nobody else hear you, God loves to hear you sing. But make sure we're singing God's songs that will lift Him up. That will bring honor to Him. Attending church. Not just occasionally, but to attend with a passion. Not out of a duty or obligation. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here tonight because you're here. But we need to make sure we come with passion. Don't just come to church because, well... Brian said we're going to have revival and I better show up. I won't be honest, that's not a reason to come. The reason to come is because we got a Savior who loved us enough to die on the cross to save an old wretched soul, sinner like me and a sinner like you. And He's worthy of our worship, He's worthy of our praise, He's worthy of us coming together and bringing honor and glory to Him. That should be our desire, to worship. 
And then, of course, giving. We could go on with many things, but and in confessing. Let me just say one last thing in here. Have you been in practice of confessing? We live in a world, folks. We live in a world that never wants to admit they're wrong. How many of us like to admit we're wrong? How many? I'm going to tell them myself. I don't like for my wife to point out that I've messed up. And let's be honest. When we mess up, it's easy sometimes to blame it on somebody else, isn't it? <laughs> it's easy to blame it on somebody else. Let's just be honest. You know what the Bible says? It says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that's good. No, not one. That means we're going to mess up. That means we're going to sin. And you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to practice confessing our sins. It's okay to use this altar. It's okay to get up here and, and talk to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I've hung my harp in the tree, and, I, and I've stopped singing. I've stopped making a joyful noise for you. Oh, folks, we get out of practice. And we can't have real joy when we're not doing what God has called us to do. I read a story uh, uh, not too many uh, long ago about a soldier, uh, 18 soldiers in World War II. They were pinned down in enemy fire. And one of them was mortally wounded. And he began to beg those around him. He said, tell me how I can meet God. And every one of them, they passed it around and said, what do we tell him? And it was finally one guy who said this. Well, I used to go to church a little bit when I was little. But I really don't know anything about how to be saved. Folks, that young man died lost and hellbound because no one could tell him how to be saved. No one could tell him. Sad, but many Christians, folks, we couldn't lead someone to, 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 to salvation to, through Jesus Christ because we're not, we're not in practice. And most of us don't want to. Somebody comes to us and says, How can I be saved? Well, let me kick you to the preacher, let me take you to a deacon. Folks, we need to be able to stand and proclaim and tell someone how to be saved. Because you know what? Brian might not always be available to, t to lead someone to Christ. And they may need it in a time when only you can do that. So first thing you need to do is practice, isn't it? So let's move on. The harps are silent because they were out of practice. If you're out of practice, I beg you to come and repent. Reason number three and last was they were out of plans. You say, what, what? Notice there in verse number 4. It said, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? These people had hung up their hearts for another reason. What was that reason, preacher? They had no plans to play it. They just decided, we're not going to play our harps. We're not going to serve God in this God-forsaken land. They were in the midst of these heathen world, and they could have made a difference in the lives of these people, yet what did they say? We will not pray, uh, play. Folks, let's be honest. They were saying, we don't care if these people know God or not. I'm not going to share my song with them. Folks, the world around us today is lost and dead in sin and hell. And the reason so many of our harps are silent, let's just be honest, is because we as believers have just made plans we're not going to tell nobody. I know that's probably not good English, it's good preaching. We're not going to tell anybody. We just don't intend to play. We don't care. Many of us have opportunities to tell someone and we sit down and we say nothing because we have no intentions to reach them. Again, we, we make all those excuses. It's real easy. It's the preacher's job. It's the deacon's job. I don't have enough. I don't know enough about Scripture. The Bible says, I don't have time. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. If we don't have time to be able to tell somebody about Jesus, we're absolutely too busy. My job keeps me busy, my family keeps me busy. 
And heaven forbid that many of us would say this, but unfortunately it does happen. They're just not my class of people. I've done enough. I used to be. I used to be a choir member. I used to be a Sunday school teacher. I used to go out and tell people. I used to be a witness. I, I used to do this. I used to do that. Or maybe we use the excuse, I'm afraid. Let me tell you something. When you say you're afraid, just remember what Paul wrote to young Timothy. He said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and a love and of a sound mind. See, we offer these excuses, and what we're really saying, folks, is simply this. Well, I just don't have any plans to serve God. Tonight, are our hearts silent? Because we've made no plans to reach our family. We've no plans to reach our, our friends. We've no plans to reach our co-workers. We've no plans to reach our classmates. We've no plans to reach the bum on the street. We've no plans to reach the executive in the, in the, in the main office. Are our hearts silent because we have no plans to give, the, the, to give to the work of the Lord our money, our time, our talents, our energy, or our efforts? I'm afraid many of us have probably had the mindset of that Jeremiah had at one time. Remember what Jeremiah said? I'm going to paraphrase that. He said, I'm tired. I'm just going to sit down. I ain't, going to, I ain't even going to mention God no more. I'm not going to speak any more in His name. But I just can't do that. He's like a fire in my soul. It's got to come out. Folks, that's the kind of fire we need. That's the kind of revival we need. That we'll have that fire bursting out in our hearts that we cannot be quiet. We cannot be still. We've got to get out. We've got to sing the song. We've got to play the song that says, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Oh, folks, is our heart silent because we just stop planning to, to serve God? If so, we need to repent. We need to repent. Now, we've said there's some reasons that uh, uh, Israel's hearts were silent. Truth number two. We won't stay here long, but truth number two. The results of silent harps. What happened? Israel's harps were silent, but what happened? Well, first of all, result number one was the silent harps brought sorrow and remorse. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at our verse number one. It says they sat down and wept. Notice how being out of the will of God in a backslidden condition had caused them to experience no joy. Even to the point of weeping, tears of sorrow and sadness. Christians, if we would think for just one minute, if we would be happy, joyful, if we think for one minute that we can be happy and joyful when we're living apart from God, we're deceiving ourselves. Satan has tricked us into thinking, oh, we can, just, we can have joy and, and not have to serve God. But if we're children of God, we are missing the joy, the peace, and the excitement that comes with playing our hearts for the Lord. Examples. Scriptural examples. How about David? David re, uh, cried out in Psalm 51. What did he say? Restore the joy of thy salvation. But why? Because he found no joy in sin. Peter, he went out and he wept bitterly. He found no joy sitting among the world. How about Lot? He, well, we talked about him losing his family except for his two daughters and, and they caused him to sin and become the father of Amnon and, and Moab who would battle the, the, against Israel really up and even through today. He found no joy living in the world. Samson, he lost his power, his eyesight, his freedom, and his sorrow. He was turning that grinding wheel, saying, Oh, I wish I hadn't laid in the lap of the world. No joy. You can just see him crying in remorse. Jonah went the other way, and what ended up? He ended up in the belly of a fish. How many of us are facing our belly of the fish experiences? Because we have turned our back on God. The prodigal lost all the things that he had to the world. He ended up feeding and, and eating with the pigs. How sad that many people have walked with God. Christians, maybe you're here tonight. You've walked with God. You've talked with God. You've worshipped. You've used your talents to serve Him. But then one day you begin to follow the world. 
You begin to drift away from God. Whatever may have caused it, slowly you drift away, and finally you hung your harps in the willow trees and have said, I'm done. But now you're experiencing that remorse. Now you're experiencing that lack of joy. You see, the world may look at you and say, well, they're successful. But you're looking at yourself and say, I'm a pauper because I have no joy in the Lord. Because you see, all the money, all the recreation, the fame that the world has to offer will never bring real peace and it'll never bring real joy. The result was sorrow and remorse. But a second result, silent harps, harps kept them from reaching others. Notice there in verses 3 and 4. Let's go back and read it one more time. It said, For there, there are they that carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they that wasted us, required of us mercy, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing, they said, uh, the Lord's song in a strange land. Folks, did you, did you really understand what it was saying? Here was the people of Babylon, and they needed to hear about God. Let's go back for just a moment. What was God's plan for Israel all along? To be his mouthpiece to the world. To tell the world about him. Now they'd been failing to do that, but now he's carried them to Babylon. And here's a people that wants to hear about God. They want to hear the songs of Zion. And notice it said they required of us a song. But what did the Israelites do? They refused. They said, we will, we cannot, and we will not play. They were to be God's voices. Oh, how many times do we miss someone who desires to hear about the God we serve, and we are silent. We're silent. You know, wonder what had happened if Peter had told the one standing around the fire that Jesus, who Jesus was instead of denying who he was. Wonder what would have took place. How about Lot's family? Wonder what would have happened to Lot and his family had he went into Sodom instead of uh, uh, joining in with the crowd, went down there and preached the gospel so they could know about a God who loves them. Folks, we have multitudes around us today who need to hear about Jesus. And we today are to be God's voice and His light in this sinful world so others who need help can know that Jesus is our wonderful Savior. Yet so many of us in our churches tonight, we took our harps and we put them in the willow trees and we say we cannot and we will not play. Folks, are we so far away from God that we're beyond helping those around us? Now, I'm not talking about social gospel. <laughs> I'm going to just jump on that for just a moment. Folks, let me tell you something. I believe that it's good to, to fix backpacks, and I believe it's good to provide food, and I believe it's good to provide a lot of things. But let me tell you something. If we provide them food, and we provide them clothes, and we provide them even a place to stay, and never tell them about Jesus, all we're going to do is send them to hell with clothes on their back and a full belly. We need, we need to be telling them about Jesus. We've hung our harps uh, in the willow and we've been silent way too long. That's, what's, that's the reason. Can I just be honest? That's the reason. Our world, that's the reason our country, that's the reason our state, that's the reason our counties are in the shape they're in. Because many of our church folks, myself included, we've hung our harps in the willow trees and we've decided we're not going to serve. We're out of practice. We don't have no plans. We're just, we're just here. We're out of place. So I want to ask you tonight, are you in the right place with God? There's a reason you're not playing your heart because you're out, of, you're out of God's will. You're not where you're supposed to be. You're not serving God the way you're supposed to serve Him. Let's put it this way. Let's put it like old Enoch. You're not walking with God like you're supposed to. Maybe you're out of practice. You, you've stopped playing for the Lord daily. And today's the day you need to repent and get back right. Maybe you just your plans have been not centered on God's will, but they've been centered on your will. Well, it's time to lay our will down at the altar and leave it 
pick up his will and carry it back with us. Folks, it's time that we ask God to forgive us. Just go back to that confession. It's time to confess our sins. Get our harps out of the willow trees and begin to let the lost world know we're playing for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And folks, it's when God's people begin to play our harps that real revival can begin and spread to our communities. And then let me say one other thing. You may be here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't even know exactly what we're talking about. Well, let me share something. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. And if you should die, you will spend an endless eternity in a place called hell. And there's no true joy in living a life apart from God. But Jesus came and he died on the cross to pay a sin debt that I couldn't pay and that you couldn't pay. But he was willing to pay that debt. He died on the cross and then he arose from the dead so that we could live eternally. And he says, all you have to do is just accept by faith. Accept by faith me. And he'll come and he'll forgive us of our sins. He'll come into our lives and live. And he'll give us joy deep down in our hearts. And when we got that joy, you'll be able to sing. You'll be able to play your harp. Maybe not a physical harp, but that literal, uh, that, 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 that symbolic harp that the world can know you are a child of the King. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. God, I pray right now that as we come to this moment of invitation time, that God, you just speak through uh, the Holy Spirit to the hearts of each and every one of us here. Lord, I pray for revival to begin, and I pray for it to begin in my heart. God, I, I pray for your forgiveness. Yes. I pray that you, you touch me. Let this message speak to my heart. And then I pray that it move out into this congregation that we could begin a revival here that would just grow and grow, not for my glory, not for Brother Brian's glory, but for your glory, God, because you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. In Jesus' name we pray.